Thanks to improved tooling and workflow, I'm able to save bandwidth that in turn I can put back into the video to increase the overall quality in the visual area as well as the area of sound. And thanks to improved automation, I save so much time that I can now have fancy 3D overlays on every single video of mine. Like this. Google RS Deaf Diary Episode 3 To make it work right. I have no idea what the title is supposed to imply because I think that since the last version I released everything is working just fine. So uh, let me show you. The YouTube uploader works just fine for instance. As you can see here it uses a lot of memory, okay? It appears to be loading everything it reads into memory first before it does anything and then it consumes the entire CPU which results in sluggish bandwidth usage. Well. All right, all right, a minor setback, but I tell you that most files I have are underneath two gigabytes, so I can still do it, right? It will still work. In theory, practically YouTube is the only server out there that rejects null values in request structures, which means that I can upload files to Drive via HTTPS, but I cannot upload anything to YouTube. Seeing his work shattered like that made Byron very, very sad. And then angry. However, he managed to follow the track of bytes through Hyper down to Rust OpenSSL, which indeed happened to cache everything before the final flush for some yet unknown reason. But there is nothing more to do than setting up an issue and hope for someone capable of helping to come to the rescue. Fine, but what about the null values then? Well, possibly I can do it like, possibly I can, uh... So he asks on GitHub, hoping that eventually he will get some help and consideration. <sighs> Alright, nothing left to be done here, so let's distract myself with uh, usability. Previously, all that existed in terms of argument parsing was this grammar here. And docop would generate the code required to parse this for you. The problem with that is that, for one, it was very slow unless you compiled in release mode. And additionally, it would have no help associated with it. So this command is not really self-documenting unless you consider this basic grammar here, self-documenting, but there was no associated information to what each of the methods here do, for instance. It's also kind of, re kind of repetitive, which uh, doesn't help the overall look and feel. Um, to add insult to injury, whenever there was something wrong, it would only tell you argument error or parse error, but not what actually triggered the error. This is what would make it very hard to learn a new command and to use it without the help of this online documentation that I uh, provide as well. That command line is uh, not quite there yet, but uh, what could replace it? Is there anything that is better and user-friendly? Hmm. I get it now. I get it. Something wants to tell me something. Someone wants to tell me something. Something. Maybe me. Telling myself that I need clap is a command line argument parser for Rust. It's written exclusively for Rust and uh, you know, once you first land here, you see that it's full of documentation. It's kind of very nicely pre presented uh, on the readme here, as well as on the documentation pages, which are linked here right away. So the overall impression is awesome and when you first use it you won't be disappointed because it just keeps going like that. So clamp to me is like the argument parser that users want to use and also that programmers want to use who have to use it to uh, implement it in their apps. So as you can see it's it's using the builder padding, which is quite common these days, uh, to allow you to set up your application and with it your argument parser rather easily. Neato. I was super happy to have something that allows me to use the builder pattern because that usually makes it very easy to read the code and to see what's happening. And uh, producing this using the generator was also uh, more than easy, so no big deal here. The first thing you see is that I could add help text everywhere. 
this makes it much easier to have a command line based help without you needing to resort to the online manual all the time. And something else you see is that in case of YouTube, for example, the definition of the command using the builder pattern could be rather massive. Not yet done, still working on it. Wait, a, give, it give it a moment. Okay. 1,500 lines of code to define that command. And you know, what do I care? I'm fine with that. I don't care about the details, but unfortunately Rust doesn't. Uh, uh, actually Rust does care about the details, <laughs> which means that effectively this will compile, but crash in the moment you start the program with a stack overflow, yes. So the Rust compiler will produce code that overflows its own stack. And unfortunately, you seem to be unable to, at compile time, set the stack um, for your main thread. You are able to set the stack for your um, threads that you are creating at runtime. So you basically, you could move the creation of the command to a thread if you so desire and set up a huge stack to be able to ha uh, handle it and then basically return the matches from your thread. But of course, this comes along with quite a lot of overhead. And it also seems weird because I want to set it up for the main thread, right? That's kind of the uh, idea behind that. But no one could tell me how to do that. Maybe it's not yet possible. Well, I call that a little shortcoming, but nothing that couldn't be worked around. The solution to this was to just not create all these individual uh, argument structures and app structures uh, that are part of that builder pattern, but instead create a simple, basically plain old data um, structure here that consists of some vectors that will be heap allocated right away and uh, basically make sure this actually works. So for instance, that's the YouTube command again, but with a different style. So as you can see, I define a relatively dumb plain data structure right away with all the arguments that I require. And then at runtime, I will iterate it to set up their uh, argument or the command that I actually want. So here is, is where the parser is generated with all its subcommands and arguments respectively. And uh, that is it, that works pretty fine. And it works for arbitrarily sized commands as well. So far, I didn't find one that would cause the stack overflow again. It's again, a few thousand lines of uh, definition code, but I think in the end, uh, that doesn't really matter. Compile times weren't really affected, but fortunately doing it like that is much, much faster. So now in debug mode, the command will start up in just 0.0 one seconds or something or 0.01 seconds uh, compared to the previous 0.5 seconds for the YouTube command. Quite amazing. So at the end of all that work that happened in the meanwhile, it now looks like this. So that's the YouTube command. If you execute it, here you go. The help will reveal much more information about it and also uh, provide you uh, with a link to the online help. For instance, if you want to know more, you can just go here and be fine with it. And also, of course, download the command. Um, what's more important, if you, for instance, want to deal with the videos, oh, the subcommand video isn't valid. Did you mean videos? Yes, there's a did you mean for pretty much anything. So videos here, we can ask for help. <clears throat> Maybe like this. There's no did you mean for help, unfortunately. Uh, but that's not a big deal. And here again, it will provide you with the respective information. And what's even better that by now, Clap is actually able to tell you exactly what is needed to make this happen. And that's super awesome because you will never ask yourself what uh, or why this didn't work. No, instead, you just have to follow the instructions here. And um, in case you want to know more about the, for instance, deletion of videos, you can now look online. Actually, for the insertion, it might be, might be even more interesting because insertion requires a request structure and is by far more complex. And even here, you will not have all the information that you ever wanted. For instance, what's the P stuff doing? What's the R stuff doing? What's these field and parameters uh, that he's talking about there? And the answer is this. So now you can jump right in and here you have a documentation of the entire of the entirety of parameters and request structures. And as I said, video insert is one of the bigger ones. So that's a good example on how complex this can be. 
Now that usability is in order, let's revisit old issues of ours. Fortunately, OpenSSL has seen a fix, thank you Steven, to apply it, which actually allows us to, you know, just use not all of our main memory when trying to upload anything. It's pretty awesome and appeared to be working for me, but hey, I'll show you anyway. Invoking the command, just using the simple protocol to make sure it doesn't reject my null values that are still in there. And as you can see, you see nothing. I mean, not much CPU, it's not building up memory, but it's shifting 12 megabyte per second towards YouTube. That's awesome, it works. Problem solved. Now that OpenSSL has fixed itself, let's see what CERD can do for us. There has been some activity, I mean, basically triggered by myself, but did I get a reply? Did I get a reply in the meanwhile? Oh, uh, no, actually. Eric, what? <laughs> okay. So, I gotta do it myself then. Huh, how can I get, well, so how could I get rid of the null values in the most efficient and, you know, energy conserving way? My time matters too. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I've got these byte strings that Sir generates. And I could parse them back into tokens using a lexer, which I write, and then I write a filter operating on the lexical level to uh, find patterns of key value tokens that uh, have a null value in there. And then I reserialize this result back to a string. Sounds simple. Sounds like the bestest idea ever in this world. Let's do it. Welcome to the JSON tools. Okay, so here are the individual parts that had to be created to filter key values um, properly. So first you need a JSON lexer, something that parses bytes and makes it into lexical tokens so that you can more easily analyze that. Then you need a filter, which is able to detect patterns within the lexical tokens that are fed to it and remove a few of them, which shall be the key equals null values in our case. And finally, something that reads a uh, stream of tokens and makes it into a stream of bytes, something that puts that behind a reader interface so that I can just pass it on to people like uh, Hyper, for instance. Sounds simple and is exactly as simple. Let's have a look at the code. So here's the, here's the lexer and there's some, some matching going on. It's implementing the iterator interface, so it takes a character iterator, sorry, a byte iterator, U8, and by itself it produces tokens. So it basically converts bytes into tokens, and it's all based on iteration, which is basically a form of streaming, right? So it's all streaming here. And then we have the filter. The filter is a bit either. So it's an iterator as well. It takes another iterator that produces tokens and then it iterates over these tokens and tries to make sense of that. So the thing here that doesn't fit horizontally onto my screen is the evil magic match expression that I use to very efficiently though and very safely uh, match these. I mean, I think it's efficient, maybe it's shit. Uh, but it works. I think that's pretty important. And uh, last but not least, the reader, which implements the read interface or the read trait. Sorry, we're not interfaces here, we're traits. And uh, well, basically makes tokens into strings. And that's, you know, just a few lines of code, as you can see, rather simple. Uh, it's producing very efficient uh, white spaceless strings from the tokens that it gets, and that's it. And a little, little bit of extra here, there is, you know, more boilerplate than everything else. It's an iterator extension that basically straps additional functions on compatible iterators. So those token iterators, they will have um, basically constructors that allow you to easily create filters 
and a reader in the end. And last but not least, this is now used in, um, for instance, YouTube, oops, the YouTube library. I am unable to show it, but there it is used in to great effect. Oh, this is why Google RS. <clears throat> there it is used to great effect to filter the values and Lexer, maybe I'm I'm unable to find it. Oh, that's the wrong one. Uh, YouTube lib. I might cut stuff out of here. So there is the code that actually does the filtering in the library. So yes, we serialize into byte strings first, then we uh, do a lexical analysis and we serialize it uh, back. But I think the performance of this is like 150 megabyte per second of byte strings. Uh, which is rather fast and I think it's very mem memory efficient too because we don't build big uh, heap allocated structures all we need is basically one output buffer that does the rest yeah all right now that the JSON tools are ready for prime time for at least the library related work let's have a look if there is possibly a reply a reply to my question on how to filter null values and and oh there is a reply Look at that. Remove null. So, oh, you can serialize stuff into a JSON value structure, which happens to be just like a like a nested dictionary of things. And in there, you can do all the filtering that you desire, and then you serialize this changed structure into a string just using the normal tools, and you are done. And this would have worked for the back end as well as for the front end. And oh my god. Yeah, the point is I've got an implementation for the back end and I'm gonna keep it. And for the front end, it's still useful because I don't have pretty printing yet. So this really made the differences, really helped, even though it was a few days late for me because I spent the past two days to do the JSON tools anyway. But on the other hand, I wanted to do them because I definitely wanted to write a JSON lecture and see how fast that stuff could get in Rust. You know, I'm I'm having this this thing about performance sometimes and really, really have to have to see it. So um, yeah, let's let's see. Let's have a look at the let's have a look at the command line uh, interface there. So there is the CLI common where the remove null values is implemented. This is basically the working version. And this is how you can do it, really. It's that easy. And I just use it in uh, the command line tools uh, and use it for pretty printing, and that's pretty much it. So that these few lines of code could have been what I, you know, what took me two days in a very, very convoluted and let's say more difficult way. But I think it's a good thing to have given another JSON lexer to this world and, you know, I find it useful and maybe one day you can do high performance uh, JSON stream analysis or filtering. Um, and that's the point here, you can stream that stuff. You don't have to load it into memory. So their lexical level things are actually quite good. And maybe one day it will be useful to uh, someone who is not me, who just keeps it in the belly of his library because I think it's good and I like it. But I also like this, you know, both, both ways of doing it have their benefits. To wrap it up, the version of the Google command line interfaces that you see in front of you is the latest and greatest and I think it's totally ready for production because I use it and I've made it so that I like to use them. So it's really easy to get information about them or about the command line interface that you are interested in in particular, like maybe Drive or YouTube and to obviously download pre-compiled versions. Uh, there's more to come because I'm not yet fully satisfied with the feature set of what they can do. After all, I want fully resilient operation. Uh, there's still some more work to be done, but this is already a good start and it's super useful if you want to integrate these kind of Google tools into your command line tools and would like them to be more efficient than existing Python or Java wrappers, even Go wrappers, because uh, the latter don't have that much uh, features. So I think the Rust one is pretty decent, pretty usable. And if not, please leave an issue on GitHub and let me know what you think. Thanks for watching and hope to see you around.